What I wanted to uh, cover today is uh, something that is a tradition, and of course the, the feasts uh, have a lot of tradition going back through history, and uh, even in the, uh, say, the 20th, 21st century Church of God, there are uh, traditions. But one tradition is at the festivals, certain books of the writings are to be read uh, by the Jewish people, cert certain uh, aspects of the Jewish people. They, during the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread, they read the Song of Solomon. And then typically at Pentecost, they read the Book of Ruth. Well, in the fall, at the fall festivals, they read the book of Ecclesiastes. And the uh, tradition of reading that, uh, I have kind of taken up every year. And it's not a difficult task for me because Ecclesiastes is, is one of my favorite books. And it's, in one way, can be a little bit, uh, I guess, discouraging or maybe even depressing to some when you read Solomon's uh, Oh, explanations of life and, and some of the hardships and trials and, and the futility of it and the temporary uh, aspects of it. But I just appreciate it because it is a journey and it's a, a realistic look at what we call life. And that is that journey. And of course, just coming out of the festival season, we consider our lives, the lives of those we look, look around at, and we see the hardships and all. But what we are looking for is that end result and that goal, that uh, the fulfillment. And that's summed up in a familiar verse that we've read this season, and that is uh, Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 3. And... It's the sort of the summary of the, the dwelling with God and the tabernacling with God. It says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And that is the goal. That is worth all the effort that we are putting into this life. And that's the conclusion we seek and live for. Well, when it comes to this journey, you know, Sol Solomon also made a conclusion, uh, a conclusion on how to cope with and how to survive in this journey we call life. And although I want to look at a few certain areas in Ecclesiastes, I'll start by forward forwarding to that conclusion. It's, most of us are familiar with Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. And... Solomon says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole man. So the reason I bring up the conclusion before we start is I believe most of you are familiar with that. And I believe us who are called by God, or we who are called by God, have an advantage because we know that that's how we should live to put the things in Ecclesiastes in perspective. And otherwise it could be very much a futile effort, this life. Without God, without his purpose, without his plan, many aspects of life seem futile and discouraging and depressing. Now, one thing I think we should avoid is... Uh, you know, to say, well, I do obey God. I fear God. I keep his commandments. I don't have to worry about these things Solomon is talk, or talking about. And granted, obeying God does shield us from many of the adverse effects that society suffers because we are not promoting the cause. So if we, if we take that cause away, there will be some things we are shielded from just from cause and effect because we won't experience a, a self -inflict, as many self-inflicted uh, effects. But since we interact with family, friends, brethren, and yes, the world, and yes, we are humans ourselves, and we fall down, we certainly can't proclaim that we will have a trial-free, trouble-free life. That's just not a realistic view, and I don't think uh, 
anyone here would believe that, although there are certain aspects of religion who might tend to portray that as, as a, uh, a life we can have in this world. But it's kind of summed up in that familiar phrase, bad things happen to good people. And in John 16, Christ reinforces this when he tells us, you will have tribulation. So we know many of the ills and trials of, of living life are going to come our way. Now, my hope and prayer is that you, uh, as you seek God, you have a, a peaceful, prosperous, and an opportunity-filled life. And uh, I know we kind of use the feast as a yearly milestone. Sometimes when I look back, those were the kind of years I had. They were great. And then I look, you know, some of the years were pretty tough. And, you know, you, you go to the feast, you obey God, but uh, th there were there's some tough times and tough things happen to you. Uh, you know, when we think about life and what Solomon's saying here about life, we recognize that Solomon had great opportunities. You know, many of those were, were a result of his father David's relationship with God, and many, I believe, were because of his humility when he began his reign as king, when we read about the dedication of the temple and, and other things, he was very devoted to God. But we know later, even with all his wisdom, he strayed from his own conclusion, and it resulted in the split of the kingdom of Israel. Now, Solomon knew prosperity, and he knew opportunity. If we'll turn to 1 Kings, the fourth chapter, we'll just read a little bit about how life was for Solomon on a daily basis and what his provisions were on a daily basis. 1 Kings 4, verse, starting in verse 22, we see that he had opportunities and he had blessings. 1 Kings 4, 22, And Solomon's provisions for one day was 30 measures of fine flour and threescore measures of meal. 10 fat oxen and 20 oxen of the pastures and 100 sheep besides harts and roebucks and fallow deer and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from Tipsa even to Aza over all the kings on this side of the river and he had peace on all sides around about him. Peace and prosperity. In verse 25, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree from Dan even to Beersheba all the days of Solomon. And as we've been reflecting during the feast, that sort of rings uh, the verse in Micah 4.4 4, where every man was, had his own vine and his own fig tree. So if there ever was a setting near millennial in the history of Israel, uh, this was it during Solomon's reign. And over in Second Chronicles, we read a little bit more about the account of Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 9, chapter 9 beginning in verse 20, we read a little bit more about his blessings, his opportunities, and, he sa and it says, All the drinking vessels of King Solomon were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forests of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was not anything accounted of in those days of Solomon. So things were so good economically that... Gold was the standard. Silver was, I likened it to here, it sounds sort of like it was like aluminum foil or something. So th that's, how, that's how good the times were. In verse 21, for the king's ships went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Every three years, once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. In verse 22, and King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. Now, with all this in mind, let's go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we see, despite all this, despite the greatness of the kingdom and uh, the wisdom of King Solomon, there are so many things in life that he couldn't fix. He couldn't control. And he expresses those in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, brethren, we may not have the same opportunities as Solomon, but if we live in these United States we do have opportunities that much of the world has never had and do not have. 
And yes, despite those opportunities, we also recognize there are so many things in life that we can't fix and we can't control. But a king is coming, and we pray soon, who will fix, who will solve the evils of this world. Solomon was frustrated, and like I said, we too can get frustrated. Let's look at some of the frustration Solomon expressed in the book of Ecclesiastes, but let's not leave it there, because just two more books over in the book of Isaiah, let's notice the solution. For every one of these ills and these troubles, we are promised a prophesied solution. And these are the prophecies foretelling that coming kingdom of God. The first frustration I'd like to look at is in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 15. And it, it's really kind of a summary of all of them. And these, can, these that I've presented can kind of overlap or be intertwined, or you could, we could probably come up with a, a great many more of them. But uh, in Ecclesiastes 1.15, Solomon says, That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. And even if humanly we could straighten out even the, the things that man has made crooked, there are just certain things that we're not going to be able to. Let's look at chapter 7, verse 13, because we'll read the solution here in a minute. It says, Ecclesiastes 7, 13, consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he has made crooked? So there are some things, they may just be an inconvenience or they may be an evil, but we do not have in and of ourselves the ability to fix them. But we do have those wonderful promises and prophecies, and I, I forward to the book of Isaiah and I'll begin in chapter 40, which is the beginning of what's known as the volume of comfort from chapter 40 through chapter 66. And, you know, we look at all these things that are crooked, and we wish we could make them straight. And, and there's, there are a lot of us wanting the right things. But when we look at society and government and religion, we see things are broken, things are corrupt. But in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, Verses 4 and 5, here's the promise. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and every hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Another verse in Isaiah is a page or two over in chapter 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and will hold your hand and will keep you, and give you for a covenant the people for a light to the Gentiles. Excuse me, 16. I'm on the wrong verse. <laughs> verse 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things I will do unto them and not forsake them. That verse fits a little better. Saying essentially the same thing. And then over in the 45th chapter... In the prophecy for Cyrus, Isaiah 45, verse 2 and 3, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder the bars of iron. And I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, which call you by your name and the God of Israel, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. So God... Is the one with our soon coming King and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will make the crooked straight in the coming thousand years. Another frustration, I'll be turning to Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, and verse 15. Ecclesiastes 2 15 is what so Solomon notices here that a just man perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongs his life in wickedness. And then that is frustrating. As we read verse 15, Then I said in my heart, As it happens to the fool, so it happens even unto me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, That is also vanity. 
It's, it's sort of like Solomon saying, what's the use? Verse 16, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dies the wise man? Same as the fool. Verse 17, therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. And that terminology, vanity and vexation of spirit, is uh, likened to chasing the wind. You know, it's, it's, it's useless and futile. So here, this is a real frustration to Solomon, and I think uh, we can relate to that. Uh, you know, a just man seems like sometimes they're taken before their time, and, and it's frustrating. And then, you know, I've worked in construction most all my life, and occasionally you run across some pretty unsavory characters, and they will talk about someone in their peer group who's even more unsavory, and they'll say, well, he's going to live forever. No matter what he does, he gets away with it, and he's always coming out on the right end of the deal. So we can kind of look at life and, and see what Solomon's saying here, that, you know, you, you have a, a wise man whose life is taken early, and it's, it's uh, frustrating. And if, if we don't have the hope of God's kingdom and the resurrection, then, of course, it is futile. But over in Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, and I know I've, I've read where many of the prophecies, a lot of religion believes these are just for Israel. They've been fulfilled. But uh, I noticed the heading in my Cambridge Bible on this page says, God comforts the church with his promises. So that's the heading at the top of uh, my Bible. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 1. But now... Thus says the Lord that created you, O Jacob, and he that formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by your name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Verse 3, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, and Ethiopia, and Seba for you. Since you are precious in my sight, you have been honorable, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. God comforts us with these words when we look at the frustrations in life. And I think about a New Testament promise here in Romans 6, verse 9, just to paraphrase, it says, Death has no more dom dominion over us. And then, you know, those of us who are blessed to be in the first resurrection, blessed and holy is he. The second death has no power upon them. So we have the promises in Isaiah and the promises in the New Testament of the resurrection. And those whose lives were cut short, well, yes, we will see them again. Now back to Ecclesiastes, and we read verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 2, but I'll start with it on a, on a little another aspect of frustration that I know can plague us and Solomon wrote about it. It says, Therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, and all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Grievous labor. Let's continue in verse 18. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knows whether he shall be a wise man or a fool, yet shall he have rule over my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that has not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This is also vanity and he calls it a great evil for someone else <laughs> to benefit from your hard work uh, undeservingly. Well Let's look ahead in Isaiah chapter 65. We're looking at the problem and then we 
Look over a few pages for the solution. Isaiah 65, verse 21. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Not grievous and uh, unfulfilling. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Now I believe these words tend to refute a forced distribution of wealth. And I don't want to confuse that with what God expects of us to be giving, caring, loving, and sharing. But from what I read, we are to produce and enjoy the fruits of that production. And so oftentimes, you know, the system we have today, that's not the case. And then Solomon continues in Ecclesiastes 2. Let me read verse 24. There is nothing, this is what I would say, recognizing the conclusion he gave and enjoying what we can now because uh, this is our time. Judgment is upon us now. And we are setting an example, even with battling Satan, battling society, uh, for those so that once we are kings and priests in the kingdom of God, we will have the experience. We will be the teachers and the leaders of that kingdom headed up by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 24, There is nothing better for a man than he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This I also saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten hereunto, hereunto more than I? And of course, I don't think any of us have the daily provisions that Solomon had. So he, he definitely could experience this. For God gives to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he gives travail and to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit, knowing that the prophecy there in Isaiah will be the fulfillment. And we, we live that conclusion today to enjoy it all we can. But we know that for the rest of the world, that kingdom is, is still yet to come. And of course, we, we have to live with the shortfalls that are the frustrations we're reading about. Another frustration is in chapter 3, verse 11. And I don't see uh, Solomon necessarily expressing so much frustration over this. I'm going to say we are the ones frustrated by this. Uh, Solomon is really right on in his assessment of it. And that is, in verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. He also has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. So the frustration, brethren, we have is that Solomon here is saying man cannot discern origins. But I think we especially are frustrated in man's total rejection that God is the creator and he originated life. You know, the way Satan has orchestrated the counterfeit, the godless idea of the theory of evolution, and the success he temporarily, remember these frustrations are all temporary, the success Satan is enjoying now temporarily in marketing that idea through science and through the education system. In Ecclesiastes 8, verse 17, I'll keep an eye on the time. I have quite a few scriptures. Doesn't mean we have to read them all. It says, Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he will not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man may think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Man cannot discern origins. He's desperately trying to and trying to sell what he thinks is a godless 
form of, of life, of human life, and of the uh, existence. So they are ever learning, never able to come to the truth. In Ecclesiastes 3, once again, continuing in verse 12, I know that there is no good in them but for a man to rejoice and do good in this life, and that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is a gift of God. I know that whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken away from it. And God does it, that men should fear before him. So I'm thankful for the revelation of God about origins and the faith we have in him to believe that. Then let's look over in Isaiah, the 41st chapter. And Isaiah is our go-to for the solutions. And... There are some solutions offered here in Ecclesiastes, as we've noticed. There are some frustrations even mentioned in Isaiah. Isaiah 41, verse 4. Who has wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and the last, I am he. In Isaiah 64, verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has the eye seen, O God, besides you, what he has prepared for them that wait for him. Brethren, we know a lot of fellow brothers and sisters who've been waiting a long time, and we so pray for God's kingdom and look forward to it. In Proverbs 30, more words of Solomon. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who has ascended into the heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you can tell? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And you, you add, not, add you not unto his words, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar. So we have the origins revealed to us from Almighty God. In Isaiah 40, again, in the volume of comfort, verse 21, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretch out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in, that bring the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. So we know God has revealed to us the origins, and he has prophesied and promised us the future. And that one verse we read sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 2, 9, because we haven't even imagined the glory and the fulfillment of that. Another frustration, and I think this one <laughs> in current times really hits home, is uh, I'll read in Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 16. And it is something Solomon noticed. It's something we can't help but notice, and it's the perversion of justice and judgment. And in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 16, And moreover I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. And I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for there for every purpose and for every work. And I said in my heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, that they might see that they are themselves but beasts. And you know, we, I think probably every generation has said this, but we kind of see, we see civilization taking a turn, not for the better, not for the future, but back to, to even, even worse times and worse ways. And uh, of course, there's been some pretty bad ones in the history of the world. In the fifth chapter, verse 8, if you see the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter, for he that is higher than the highest regards 
and there be higher than they. So yes, it's going to take place in chapter 8, verse 5. Whoso keeps the commandments shall feel no evil thing. A wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. So we must keep continuing to practice that conclusion, to fear God and obey him, to survive, to uh, cope with this evil world, these evil justice uh, systems that we see. And in verse 6 it says, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. And it definitely is. In chapter 11, verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer in the days of your youth, and walk you in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know this, you, for that all these things God will bring you into judgment. So even though we have opportunities and we have free will, it's good to live that life knowing that, yes, God is the ultimate judge, and he will judge. And one thing that brings out this frustration in the justice systems is Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Very familiar. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in evil to do them. And that is sort of a recipe for the lack of justice multiplying the evil. And then because that sentence isn't executed speedily, things tend to uh, add up and, and be exponentially worse until God take, takes uh, things into his hands and brings forth judgment upon those that are evil. But we have the promises again. Isaiah 1, verse 27. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. Chapter 4, verse 4. And when the Lord shall have washed away all the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. A page over in chapter 5, verse 16. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. We have a righteous judge to look forward to, to his kingdom. Chapter 9, verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of, the, of hosts will perform this. God's not just going to say, okay, I'm ready to straighten out. No, he's going to do it with zeal. Chapter 16, verse 5. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. And we pray that that day is hastened when we will have righteous judgment in the kingdom. In Isaiah, the 28th chapter, this seems like a headline for today, Isaiah 28, verse 17, Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. Because lying has become commonplace in places that we used to consider institutions of integrity. In Isaiah 59, verse 8, the result of that lie upon lie and that perverted judgment is the way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. But we have a God who loves judgment, and we pray that his kingdom come to institute that judgment. In, verse, in chapter 61, verse 8, For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And we so look forward to that.
Two more very brief points as I run out of time is in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1. And that is the frustration of oppression. In chapter 4, verse 1, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter, and on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforter. And I believe this point can go beyond frustration to anger when I... Hear some of the stories of oppression. Uh, I, I hear a lot of those now uh, with my wife in her field of work, and it's confidential, but I hear the stories and the abuses of those. You know, the, the mentally ill often are very trusting people, and they, they have difficulties and challenges. So sometimes their finances are handled by a payee or someone with like a financial power of attorney over them. And it's unbelievable how some of those people, sometimes they're family members, sometimes they're, they're just uh, people who operate a group home, how they abuse those who are ill. And uh, it, it's beyond frustrating. And I thought about that when we were discussing fasting before uh, the feast uh, in the interactive Bible study and, and uh, something Dixon really brought up, but it's, in Isaiah 58, verse 6, it says, It's not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. And I, I, think, uh, I think I've benefited a lot this festival season because any fast that I may choose a reason to fast, it's always going to have this with it, to let the oppressed go free, because that is a real need in our world. In Isaiah 33, we still can look forward to the solution. Isaiah 33, verse 13, Hear you that are far off what I have done, and you that are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walks righteously and speaks uprightly Here's the conclusion we're living. He that despises the gain of oppressions, that shakes his hands from the holding of bribes, that stops his ears from the hearing of blood, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Shame on those who aren't pursuing the godly way and those who are oppressing those who are helpless or in need. And now verse 21 of Isaiah 33 but there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with our oars, neither shall gallant ships pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save us. Your tacklings are loose, they could not well strengthen their mass. They could not spread the sail. Then is the prey of the great spoil divided. The lame shall take the prey. And the inhabitant shall say, shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. And we look forward for those who are oppressed being made free. One last point is that of, in Ecclesiastes 10, of corruption and favoritism in government. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 4, If the spirit of the ruler rise up against you, leave not your place. For yielding pacifies great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low places. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. In today's systems, the unqualified gain positions of leadership, and those talented and those who can lead often are diminished and put in lower places. And there's corruption and favoritism. But in Isaiah verse 32, verse 1, Isaiah 32, verse 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And those princes and kings and priests 
will be us with the opportunity to teach, to help, to, to love in mercy. And in chapter 33, excuse me, Isaiah 49. Forty nine verse beginning in verse five. And now says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet I, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, Is it a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give you for a light the Gentiles, that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his holy one to him whom a man despise, to him whom the nation abhors, to a servant of rulers, kings shall, shall see and arise, princes shall also worship, because the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, he shall choose you. The leaders will be chosen by God. Well, brethren, I, I hope we can take a look at these frustrations but especially I hope we focus on the coming solutions that are promised to us in these prophecies. And, you know, God calls things that aren't as though they are. So to you, the kings and priests of the coming thousand-year reign of Christ, continue in your faith, practice that conclusion that Solomon mentioned of the whole matter to fear God and to keep his commandments, persevere and endure to the end. Paul says in Romans 8, 17, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You know, Solomon had one more verse after he gave that conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. He says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. We so look forward to that conclusion, to that goal. When we hear, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his God, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. We will close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, great God, we thank you once again for this service, uh, for your uh, blessings, your, the benefits you have invited us into to, to learn, to know, to grow in grace and knowledge. We ask the, your blessing on the rest of the Sabbath, on the uh, worship service here, and we pray that you be with those uh, who are traveling, those who are en route here, and all of those, as we mentioned, who need your comfort and your strength. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.